morning. I'm Cassie, a junior at Logan High School. And I'm Virginia, also a junior at Logan High School. This morning, Heather Quackenboss is joining us from UW Extension to present how to build a safe zone for LGBTQ+. Heather is the Human Development and Relationships Educator at UW-Madison Division of Extension in La Crosse County. Her focus is on well-being, culture and diversity, community collaboration, and mental wellness. Heather has worked for over 20 years in and with nonprofit agencies in La Crosse County. With her MS in therapeutic recreation, paired with her experience, Heather uses compassion, adaptability, and empathy as tools for real life. Please welcome Heather Quackenberg. Thank you guys, thank you so much. Can we give them another round of applause? Because that is really hard. And Mr. Carlson, thanks for sitting in the back while they did that. They were really not looking forward to having you in here. <laughs> so happy Monday. Thank you for coming. This is the Safe Zone presentation. Now, this whole Safe Zone thing is actually a training for two to three hours. We're going to gloss over some things today. And we're going to look at some different things that maybe we have a little bit different understanding for folks who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. And there's a lot of, you can really hear that person. Ms. McDonald, thank you. So my name is Heather Quackenboss, and that introduction made me sound really good. Frankly, um, I'm the mom of three kids, so some of you I recognize in here as my kids' teachers. So thank you, bless you, my gosh, because, man, if I had to teach them at home, I think I would have strangled them by now. Um, some of you know me from the nonprofit world, and it's, it's been a trip, right? So today we're going to look at some different things with Safe Zone. And what I'd really like you to do today is if you do have questions, let me know. Shoot them out, raise your hand, yell. I know your teachers and raising your hand is kind of this thing that you have to do. Don't worry about it. If you need to ask a question, if you're loud enough, we'll hear you, and we can, we can answer that. If, because this is not exactly conducive, to really talking about stuff that might be a little difficult to talk about, ask me afterwards or let me know and we can do something additional for your school or we can answer questions or I can find someone who actually knows the answer if I don't know that. So to start, when we look at anything that we think is different than what we know, we have what's called in our head first thoughts. And those first thoughts are just there right? They're not necessarily good or bad, but they're just what we think of first. So I'd like you to think of an airline pilot. In your head right now, what does that person look like? And shout it out. White man, right? So what if your pilot looks like that? Okay. How about if I say surgeon, what's that image in your head? Oh, come on, let's, let's hear it. White man again, okay. Was that an able-bodied white man? And one more, how about an athlete? Black female? Oh, see, now you're, you're teachers, aren't you? Hmm, right? All of us, when we heard those words, had first thoughts in our heads. They're not good or bad, necessarily. What we do with those, I'm going to trip on this tape at one point, so you were totally allowed to laugh at that. Those first thoughts, however, are what our perceptions are when we move into something, and sometimes those perceptions aren't necessarily accurate. And sometimes those perceptions turn into biases, which then hurt the people we work with and hurt folks around us. So what we're going to do is just think about your first impressions and first thoughts when you first really realized that there's folks who are gay in this world. So we're going to just think for a minute here about your first impression. When is the first time you can remember learning that some people are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or queer? Just think about it in your head. I'd 
like you to turn to a neighbor and just say, when's the first time you can recall realizing that people were bisexual, gay, lesbian, or queer? All right, and coming on back, so all of you, it sounds like a lot of you remembered. Now, where did most of that influence of your initial impressions and understanding of folks who were lesbian, gay, bisexual, or queer come from? Who was that person who was really instrumental in your life, or where did that influence come from? Think about that and share that with your neighbor. All right, and bringing it on back, one, one last question for you here. How have your impressions regarding LGBTQ changed? Since those initial impressions, how has it changed? Just think about it for a second, and then talk to your neighbor. How have your impressions changed since you first learned that folks identify as lesbian, queer, bisexual, gay? All right, and we'll bring it on back. Thank you for sharing with your neighbors. So just, just a, a show of hands, and if you're not comfortable putting your hand up, it's okay, don't put, put, don't put it up. Or if you're not comfortable not putting your hand up, then put it up, that's fine. So how many, how many of you had church or religious influence as, oh, wow, this, this really did teach me something that I know about this? Okay. How many people say, you know what, when I went to college, that's when I was like, whoa, my eyes are opened. Okay. And how many people are like, you know, I had this really amazing family that taught me all kinds of different things about lesbian, bisexual, gay. All right. Yeah, a lot less hands, right? So I was in a classroom a few weeks ago. And there was this amazing student in there, just brilliant. I mean, social justice, she is going to change this world. And she is 15. Most 15-year-olds, I think, are thinking they're going to change the world, too. I have one of those. And, you know, sometimes you're like, yeah. And sometimes you're like, oh, God. So this 15-year-old said, oh, my gosh, I'm in driver's education. And you know what they have in their books? They have he slash she. What is that? And she's like, don't they know it's supposed to be they? I'm like, you know what? Until this year, they was plural. In the dictionary, just this year, they is now OK to be singular. And for those of us who went through grammar, you know, and hooked on phonics and all of that stuff, oh my goodness, using they as singular is a hard change. It's hard. This 15-year-old, second nature, no problem. And I'm sure those driver's education books are a little higher priority now for the DMV to change. Or they will be when she's done with driver's ed. So when we look at pronouns, there are a whole lot of pronouns, and we can get pretty nervous about this. We have he and she. That's what we used to know as the singular pronouns. It's very binary. It's very either or. And we're going to learn today that gender is not black and white. It's not either or. It's not on or off. So there's a lot of pronouns that folks in the transgender community made, created, identified with. And a lot of these are listed here, Z and C, um, Xi, A, Per. We don't see a lot of those here. In a lot of these trainings, I ask because I don't hear these, so I'm not exactly sure. So I ask, and people say, oh, yeah, I've heard this, or I've heard that. 
when you're a teacher and when you work with people, it can be really tough to figure out, okay, what should I say? How can I do this so I'm not offensive? How can I do this so I, you know, don't stick my foot in my mouth, which we all do, right? You work with teenagers and kids, we do that every day. We stick our foot in our mouths. They is okay to use. So I'm here from all of the grammar teachers of your past saying it is okay to use they as singular. If you don't know, they is fine to use. A few years ago, I was on a band trip and there was an individual who was, was not binary and they didn't feel good. And the, the band director said, hey, Heather, would you take Jazz to the, and I'm making this name up, would you take Jazz to the bathroom? They don't feel good. I'm like, I don't know what bathroom to take Jazz to. And I had no idea what to do. And I'm like, I want to help this person. I know that they don't feel good. And I'm, you know, I, I think I'm a good person. I think that, you know, so all of these things are rolling through my head of shoot. You know, here I am in this situation. I have no damn clue what to do. And so I took the stupid easy way out and we got to the bathroom and thank goodness there was boys and girls right there. And I was like, here you go, go for it. And I pretended to be scared of puke. Looking back, I could have done that a whole lot differently, a whole lot better. Here's the other thing when we're looking at working with folks who might be different than us or that we don't quite understand or we don't know, it's okay to ask. And it's okay to make a mistake. Because all of these can get a little bit overwhelming. So it's okay to ask. When we're looking also at LGBTQ, a lot of times I'm asked, well, wait a minute, queer, that's not a good word. That's a bad word. People use that in a negative way. They did, absolutely. Some of us grew up, and that was like the worst thing you could call somebody. The community's taking it back. So it's an umbrella term. Queer is an umbrella term for the sexualities and the genders that fall under it. So when you look at sexuality, we're looking at lesbian, gay, and bisexual. When we're looking at gender, we're talking about trans or cisgender. And if you are a science teacher, trans and cis, all that Latin stuff, same or different, right? That's the extent of how I much organic chemistry I took from that class. It helps me now, here. So in your packets, there is something called the genderbred person. And here's where we're going to take some stuff that's a little bit complicated. We're going to try to simplify it a little bit in, in a more accessible way. So the gender bread, what you can do, your sheet's empty because sometimes we know that writing stuff down makes you remember it better. See, teachers. So our brain, that's where our identity comes from. That is who we are. And when you're looking at lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, it's not the person's only identity, right? I know some of you as my kids' teachers. I know some of you as, oh, wow, this cool person who does this. I know some of you as, oh, wow, yeah, this person's really awesome at this. That's part of your identity. So our identity is who we believe we are. And that's gender, that is sex, that is if we're a parent, that's if we're a partner, that's if we're a teacher, that's all of those things is our identity. We get down to that, no, we get down to that heart. The heart is attraction, who we are attracted to, who we love, who we try to, you know, who we like, who we go to. Sex, that's how we're assigned at birth. One of the things that people try to, you know, argue, I had, I had a Pentecostal minister in one of these trainings a couple weeks ago, which is really interesting because he was very much, here is my position and here's what's right and wrong and here's what the Bible says and Oh, that was, a, that was an interesting training, some interesting discussions. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Um, 
one of the things that he said, well, you have a penis, you're a boy. You have a vagina, you're a girl. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. There's also a lot of stuff that happens. I'm so not qualified to go into the biology or the genetics of this. Not at all. There are other things that can happen. There are other times you have the genetics, you know, XY is generally a boy, right? XX, you assign this, you're a girl. There's XXY. There's XYY. There's different chromosomal patterns that happen. There's different things that happen. So I was asked, well, can a person take a blood test then? No. <laughs> There's not a blood test for lupus, right? There's not a blood test for being a teacher. There's not a blood test for, oh, hey, this is who I love. There's not a blood test for that. But there are differences in sexuality and sex that we don't necessarily see when we see a penis and a vagina. And I can't tell you how exciting that is to just say those words in a group of teachers, right? That's like the most, the thing, you're like, whoa, I don't want to say that. So sex can be different. Expression. That's how we show ourselves. That's how we show who we are. That's how we take the identity and show it. So to get a little bit more in that, and here's where questions, throw them up here, okay? When we look at gender identity, now, this is who we are. We could be non-gendered. You know, I don't identify as a woman. I don't identify as a man. I'm non-gendered. And it goes on a scale, it's kind of a sliding thingy, of how much you feel like a woman, how much you feel like a man. Now, here's the thing. Every single one of us is on there. We either feel more like a woman, we feel more like a man, or we feel over here. We're all on each of those scales right there. Now, what Safe Zone did, because they're very nice and they know that they, we like examples, is there's infinite possible combinations here, right? But we have, we have a woman. I identify as a woman. I identify as a man. In the native population, there's something called two-spirit. And in different indigenous populations, they have multiple genders and sexual identities, not just the binary two that we white English people like to have. We also have gender queer or gender less. So you have folks who don't identify with man or woman. They are, well, I'm somewhere on this scale, and here I am. I'm genderless. So when you have folks who need to go use the bathroom, and sometimes you're trying to help, which bathroom would you prefer? And now we, we do have non-gender bathrooms. Sometimes, however, they still have the man sticker on one and the woman sticker on the other, but a sign that says, our bathrooms are for everyone. It's hard. It's hard to use the bathroom that says man when I'm not identifying as that, unless I really need to go. <laughs> then I don't care if there's a sign or not. I'll use that other bathroom. So gender identity. Now gender expression, that's how we're showing our identity, right? Sometimes, you know, we feel very, very masculine. Sometimes we feel very, very feminine. Depending on what we're doing, depending on the day, depending on how we wake up in the morning, we decide what our expression is going to be to match our identity. And sometimes it's different in different places. You know, when I'm home and I know that I don't have to go out, it's pajama pants o'clock. And my gender expression, my, all of my expression is jammy pants. If I'm going out, those jammy pants might not be the most appropriate of how I want my, to, you know, show my identity. So I'm going to show it by, okay, I'll put some real pants on. So this is two. A person might feel very agender. They might feel very much on the other side. So this, a couple of those possibilities here for what people might, might identify with, this is where we think of butch. This is, might be where we think of effeminate. This might be androgynous. This might be gender neutral or hypermasculine. We can think in our heads of, okay, you know, here's where I was feeling a little bit more masculine and here's how I express that. Here's where I was feeling a little more feminine and I expressed that. Here's where it really didn't matter and here's what I was, here's what I was expressing. 
So this is how we are, how we style our hair, what we wear, how we talk. Biological sex. So this too is on this continuum. So that sliding kind of scale. We may feel very asexual. Now, we don't identify very female. We don't identify very male. We might feel very female. We might feel very male. So this, you know, the combinations, all right, I'm that binary, I'm a male, I'm a female. But we also can have the intersex, we can have female self-ID or male self-ID. And so this is where sometimes folks get, like, stuck. But you were assigned at birth as this. Well, that was somebody who, you know, caught you coming out and said, okay, I see this, so I'm calling you that. Sometimes it's wrong. And that person is not what the doctor or the nurse or whoever you know, caught the baby on the way out said you were. And then we have attraction. Now, this is who we're attracted to. And some of us, we're not attracted to anybody. And that's all right. And some of us are attracted to more men, males, masculinity. Some of us are attracted to women, women females, femininity. And that's a whole scale, too. You know, sometimes we're like, oh, they're to this. They're to that. Well, that's your preference, right? That's who you love, who you want to be attracted to, who you are attracted to. So this is where you see folks ranging that spectrum as well. So this is where you see straight or gay or whatever that says, pansexual, asexual, bisexual. Question we get a lot is what is the difference between pansexual and bisexual? And a lot of times what's really nice, there's people who come to the training who explain things so much better than I do. And somebody said, well, bisexual is binary. It's either or. You know, I'm bisexual, so I love men and I love women. Pansexual is, it's all that continuum. And I love people all over this continuum. It's who that person is who I'm attracted to. It's not necessarily, I only love gay women. It's not necessarily, I only love gender queer. You know, it's all that. So a little more all-encompassing, not as binary. Any questions on all of this? This is like, so if you see the whole thing, there it is. And on your sheet, you have all of this. You can write some of those down if you want. This is where, when we deal with a person, it's not just one thing. When we're looking at sexuality and gender and sex and who people are attracted to, it can be, well, I didn't do very well in stats. It's limitless possibilities, right? It's all kinds of things. And so talking to people and really understanding, what do you like? Who are you? What do you want me to call you? You know, and that's for those of us who have long names, or for those of you, I don't have a name you can shorten, really. But for people with long names, sometimes, hey, my name's Samuel, but I go by Sam. My name's, you know, Penelope, but I go by Penny. You have that, and that's what the person wants, and that's who the person identifies with. And it's okay for us to say, all right, we'll do that. Okay. So what this all can mean for us is that sometimes we don't necessarily understand what people maybe go through if they identify different than the dominant culture. And so for the most part, you know, when you talked about your first impressions and when you first learned that there are folks who are gay and lesbian out there and where you first learned that, we don't necessarily think about, oh, whoa, wait a minute. I can't do this, I can't do that. So we're gonna do a little thing where you're gonna stand up and sit down because you're teachers and I know that you know all the tricks of how to look like you're paying attention. What I'm gonna ask you to do, and again, this is one of those things where if you are not comfortable standing up, don't. And if you're not comfortable staying seated, don't. Nobody's gonna know, this is all you anyway and we're just gonna kinda see how many people agree, disagree. So. If you were able to celebrate your marriage or partnership with your family, friends, and coworkers, 
Stand up. Okay. So a lot of you got to celebrate your marriage, your partnership. Thank you. You can sit down. If you know that if your partner dies, you will get leave from your employer, stand up. All right. Thank you. If you know, I'm going so, so happy today, these first few ones. If you know that if your partner dies, you will inherit what your partner has automatically at their death, stand up. All right, thank you. If on TV you watch television and you have who you identify with, multiple personal role models on television and media, stand up. Thank you. If you can share health insurance without additional paperwork with your partner, stand up. Thank you. If you can file a joint tax return, stand up. Thank you. If you can be affectionate in public without worrying about what people would think of you, stand up. Thank you. If you can go to your doctor and get treatment that doesn't conflict with your identity, stand up. All right, thank you. There's some things that we don't necessarily think about when we are the dominant culture. We don't necessarily have to think about, oh, you know, I'm going to get together with my partner and we'll both have health insurance. No problem. There's also, you know, transfer on death or wills or things that happen when your partner dies or goes to the hospital. If you go to the hospital in the ICU, man, those rules are stringent. You can go in here for this many minutes between this time and this time and you have to gown up and you have to do this. And oh, by the way, if you're not related to the person, you can't go in. There are people who are together one is the biological parent, one is not, who both of, or the biological parent gives up custody so that both parents can adopt those children. Could you imagine having a kid, having to give that kid up for X amount of time so you and your partner can both be parents legally to this kid? Get the courtroom involved, get all of that. This is what folks who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, deal with. They don't have that privilege that all of us who got to stand up have at all. There are things that they fought for. There are things that they work around. Somebody said, well, you know, that, that thing inheriting after death, isn't there a will there? Well, maybe if you have the money to get the lawyer to draw up the will, or you, you know, found a boilerplate will and you do that yourself, or that you had the wherewithal and the intelligence and the education to do that. Not everyone has that. So sometimes really looking at, okay, what are things that I don't have to think of because I'm right here, comfortable, good, that other folks do. So that's one of the things when we're working with folks who identify differently than the dominant culture is, yeah, we need to be a little bit more humble. We need to be a little bit more accepting sometimes. Okay. Any questions? Anyone brave enough in a room of like 70 people to raise their hand and ask a question? That's the other story, right? Okay. On your sheet, I think it's behind the gender bread person, there's a couple different, there's one page. On one side, it's LGBTQ inclusive language do's and don'ts. 
On the other side, it's coming out. First of all, on that LGBTQ inclusive language do's and don'ts, which you need to take an additional breath before you say that, I'd like you to look down that left side of the page where it says avoid saying. And just look down that. Is there anything on there? You're like, wait a minute, I thought this was what we're supposed to say. Or, oh, whoa, whoever used that term? Homosexual. Yeah. It's something we kind of got used to, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, that person's homosexual. Yeah, not quite the terminology anymore. Um, now, we gay. So it has a kind of why. Um, a lot of things were more medical when we started talking about it. You know, kind of like when you talk about sex, you're like, okay, well, this is the penis, and this is the vagina, and this is really hard to say in front of people, but it's medical, so it's okay. If it's medical, everything's okay, right? So yeah, we're trying to get away from just medical terminology and just saying what we want to say or what we want to be. Actually, does anyone watch Friends? Okay, so my kid's daughter, my daughter has gotten into Friends, which is entirely appropriate for a 13-year-old. And so she watches it in all of the Friends episodes, the one with... There's the one with the hermaphrodite. And I, it was just the other week, and I saw that. I'm like, oh, my gosh. This was what? I mean, the 90s were only 10 years ago, right? <laughs> and I looked at them like, oh, my gosh, this is something that we all, well, I remember in my lifetime of this was on television, and this is what we did, and this was what we thought we could laugh at and be funny about. And so, yeah, we had to pause that baby. And Netflix pauses really well. Say, okay, we don't say that anymore. And let's watch this show with kind of a, how can we break some of these biases? Because dang, yeah, right? It's like, okay, this is intersex. This is not hermaphrodite. Wow. Yeah. So some of the things that we have said, we get up here and we say, hey, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just excluding a whole bunch of people in this audience or in any audience I talk to. I'm horrible. I am so Midwest that everyone is you guys. That, that one's tougher for me to change because it's one of those, okay, everyone's a guy. Just everyone. And so to be much more inclusive and not to sound so Wisconsin, somebody said, well, we can use y'all. Which, frankly, if you look on Pinterest ever, y'all is one of those things that is in all the craft projects now. All of them. It's fall, y'all, and this and that. And I have a sister who lives in Tallahassee, so after talking to her on the telephone, I start saying it, and my husband's like, no. Mm -mm. No. But it's one of those things that, hell, it is more inclusive. Maybe the South had something going with there, y'all. A um, couple other things that we don't necessarily think of, but when we work with kids, especially those who are younger, and we look at professions that you can have, just saying the word mailman. I mean, what image does that bring to your head, right? Fireman, policeman, all of these are all of a sudden male. And so, you know, like our two amazing students in the back who possibly are interested in police work, what does that do? You know, firefighter, police officer, mail carrier. We can use those different terms that are much more gender neutral and help all of us be able to say, oh, yeah, I can see myself with that. So helping us see those things. Any other things on this sheet that were like, whoa, surprising? Something I've seen was the born female and born male. Like, yeah. Sure. And honestly, some of this language changes. It's kind of, I don't want to say that I'm comparing this to drugs. I'm not. But look at all of the terms there are for marijuana. And now all the ways to use marijuana. You know, so 
as parents, we're like, oh yeah, we, we look for the papers, right? And we look for the things. We look for the things that we remember from our teen years. Yeah, those aren't used anymore. Teenagers are like, what's a one hitter? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, that, that's not used anymore. <laughs> Staying on top of this can be, t- can be hard. And so when somebody says you were born this way, a.k.a. Lady Gaga, a little bit right, but you're also, you didn't choose that. You were born who you were, and you were assigned something. So, yeah, just better language. Better language is assigned. Okay, on that other side of that page, it's called the coming out. So one of the things that happens when, when we hear somebody's lesbian, when we hear somebody's gay, we just assume that they have to come out. Did we? You know, did I ever come out and feel the need to say, okay, guess what, everybody? I am straight. And when I got together with, you know, this guy that I maybe loved and then got married, did I have to come out and say, okay, everybody, here's the thing. I really love this person and we're going to have a partnership together. I didn't have to do that because I was privileged enough to be in that dominant culture where that, that just was okay. Now, just so you know, I did get married in Vegas, so it might only be viable in Vegas. We'll see. It's kind of what I'm going with. But when somebody comes out, we're all adding another layer of hard to their life because we're telling them, okay, what you are isn't normal. We're telling them, yeah, you got to tell us all and you have to come out and do this grand thing. And honestly, my daughter helped one of her friends bake a cake that said, by the way, mom, I'm bisexual. It was, it was kind of awesome. It was. She called me and she's like, Mom, I, I want to go home with my friend because she wants to bake a cake so she can tell her parents she's bi. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, send me a picture. That sounds kind of fun. <laughs> we didn't do that. You know, we hid stuff from our parents. And so I don't know if they found this on Pinterest or what they did. It had a total time suck. But her friend worried about this and her friend wanted her support. Now her mom was like, yeah, duh, I knew this. But parents don't necessarily know. And if you have a student who comes out to you and they say, Miss McDonald, you know, here's, here's who I am. You don't get to say, oh, hey, guess what? Hey, Mr. Maston, this person just told me this. Because then all of a sudden you're starting rumors. And if a person comes out to you, it might just be you. Coming out is not this whole complete big ceremony like graduation. It's one of those things where a person might do it here, but they don't do it here. There's people we know who are out to their friends, and they will never come out to their family. There are people who might be out with a small core group of people, but the general population doesn't know it. So their Facebook might not indicate anything. But you know, and it's hard sometimes, isn't it? When you know something about someone, it's hard to not want to share. Like, yeah, I have a gay friend. We tend to do that. We want to try to relate. You know, and all of you, if you go into school one day and you say, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. Guess what happens? Every single person you see that you tell that to is now going to be in a competition with you if they're more tired than you are. (laughs) And what happens is when we say, oh yeah, you have a gay friend, I have a gay friend too. These are people. These are human beings, right? We are human beings and who we are is not something that we want to talk around the water cooler or the whiskey jar about. It's you were trusted. You were trusted with this story. We were trusted with this person's gender identity and maybe he or she or they need help. Or maybe they just need to tell someone. So if someone comes out to you, 
there's just some do's and don'ts because honestly, this is, this is nice to have. I have a friend who was a she who transitioned to a he and I got stuck on hold it. How do I do this? It's the same person and a different name. How do I do this? I want Emily Post to tell me how to do this. And she doesn't. She doesn't tell that. But it's that support. You know, if you have a student, some of those do's, it's a sign of trust. Check in if it's confidential. Does anyone else know? Do you want anyone else to know? Do you want help with this? You've come to me. Thank you for trusting me. How can I support you? That's kind of what folks want. Okay, we have a few minutes left, so questions, comments, concerns. I think part of it is it is touchy when that happens if you don't know if it's confidential or not. We also want to honor the person that's doing the confidentiality. And Honestly, with anything, asking, humbly asking, usually works pretty well. Sometimes we will still sound like an idiot and stick our feet in our mouths. It's okay, it happens. And middle school is just so much fun anyway, isn't it? Whew. Yeah, and I think sometimes it's looking at yourself. You know, sometimes when we start snickering and laughing about things, it's because we're more nervous than, than not. And we're afraid that, oh my gosh, I maybe feel this way too, and... So, and we're trying to discover who we are. I mean, middle school is totally trying to discover who you are, but fitting in all at the same time. And so being open, being honest, being supportive. Yeah, yeah. You have... normalizing it. I mean, really. And one of the things that we're taught with with safe zone is these aren't preferred pronouns. These are your pronouns. You know, I prefer chocolate ice cream to vanilla and my pronouns this. So normalizing that. And will there sometimes be laughter and giggles and, you know, mockery a little bit? Yeah, they're middle schoolers. And we love them most days. So it's, it's, it's continuing it and making it normal. And I think a lot, for a lot of our students as teens, it's automatic for some of them to say their pronoun. And it's something that in academia anyway is becoming, you'll see in a lot of email signatures, the person's pronouns now. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And this is where we see that generational difference. I, so I try, because we work for Madison, we really try to be like completely all inclusive. Sometimes so much so that we step on our own feet, right? So I made this whole demographic chart because we have to collect demographics for everywhere we are and we can't guess somebody's demographics because we're wrong all, all kinds of times, right? So I thought, okay, what's the best way? And I researched for about a week, okay, the best questions to ask demographically so I'm, you know, most inclusive. And so on that, we actually put the pronouns, the he, she, they. I had a group of women in their 60s, like, what the hell is this? I'm like, well, that's to ask, you know, what you prefer and this and that. So generationally, our, you know, 60-year-olds might not get it as much. Or they might be just fine. I mean, these are the folks who burned their bras in the 60s, right? So they might be good. But generationally, kids are getting a little bit more used to this, depending on their background. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else? Good stories, good things you do, questions, something you want to ask, you're like, ooh. You know, I, I tend to use you all because I can't go quite with the y'all. I can't do it. Um, there are folks who have used y'all. Actually, I just talked to a server last week who said, oh, yeah, this is what I do. Um, sometimes the you, just how are you doing? You know, it's a lot more neutral. Um, any Anything that people have used? A little more inclusive, we. Nice, yeah. Or you were, you she was scratching, never mind. You, you all right? Yes. Okay, one, that's awesome, and two, that's amazing memory you have. <laughs> that's fantastic. So here's the thing. If you want to know more, if you, if you want me to come into your classroom, I can do that. I can, I can tell some middle schoolers some stuff sometimes. <laughs> Not my own, but other kids. That works much better. Thank you all. Thanks for coming today. Thank you for teaching our kids because, dang, that's a hard job. Thank you.